I, I'm trying to remember what year this is, third or fourth year that we've done um, this, this class that is for all of you, your first taste, taste of college. And I'll give you a sense of what we're going to talk about, what the format will be, and then I'll hand it over to our amazing panel of professors. But just do double check that you are um, muted to make sure we don't have any background noise during the talks. I think everyone's in, as you can see, there are quite a few of you. So uh, it looks like over 140 students. And then we have um, a, a really, as I said, excellent panel of, of professors. My name is Dr. Andrew Terrell. Um, along with Dr. Eliza Smith, we are coordinating um, the, the five weeks that you'll be spending with us learning from a, a, a number of professors from all different disciplines. Um, hopefully you've, you have a sense of what this is all about, but I'm going to give you a, a, a kind of a short a version of what this is, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, you're all here, I think, in part because it's exciting to just get started and get a taste of college, probably in part because it's nice to get a free college credit. Um, the goal of this is not only to introduce you to college, to USD, but also to introduce you to the idea of interdisciplinarity. That is the way that the various disciplines, or as you might think of them, possible majors or minors, the way they interact with each other. Um, we really strive to ensure at USD and hopefully across most colleges and universities these days, we strive to, to make sure that there's an, a communication between our various disciplines. In the past, you know, it, it was the case that some disciplines didn't really talk to each other very much, and that could lead to some issues. The, the, the kind of things I study, the environment and political science, uh, had a huge problem with this, where you had scientists who were developing incredible understandings of, of some of the major environmental problems, climate change, for example. And yet that wasn't being translated into policy, right? We weren't acting because we didn't have a robust communication between science and policy. And so that's one example, but there are many examples. And we are here to talk uh, these next few weeks about, I think you'll probably all agree, one of the major issues of our time. Um, and, and an issue that some have flagged as perhaps the most important or one of the most important issues because it can represent both amazing opportunity and incredible risk, right? So some have talked about artificial intelligence and the potential dangers, uh, dangers that could be even, at, at least according to some, um, considered uh, existential threats. So the name of our course is The Changing Face of Humanity. AI and identities of the future. And we've asked professors from all different disciplines to come and talk to you about how their discipline would approach questions of artificial intelligence, identity. Um, and, and you may be surprised. You may think of that as a very technical topic. Uh, and indeed it is, of course. Um, and you might wonder, how does, how does this relate to some of the disciplines that seem to be non-technical? I mean, I, hopefully you'll come to see that there are some really important relationships, and that is treating this as only a technical problem would shortchange it. It wouldn't give us the right kind of understanding to manage it well, to, to think of how we can get the most in terms of benefits with, with the least risk. Um, the humanities are often there as sort of, among other things, uh, guideposts to make sure that we're not allowing ourselves to be driven purely by you know, financial motives, technological imperatives, but we're also thinking it through from the standpoint of what would be good for humanity, what would be good for not just humans, but all of the other species we share the planet with, and what are our moral responsibilities, what are the sort of ethical questions that, they, that these new technologies raise. So these are the issues that, that across these next five weeks um, you'll be exposed to. And what we ask you to do, apart from the obvious of being here, you know, paying attention, participating, especially in the small group meeting that we'll have after our, our, our panelists have finished, um, and of course the, the assignment, above all else for, for, for the sake of your grade, we also ask you to, and, and I guess explicitly we ask you this in the assignments, to think across these disciplines. So don't think of these as separate talks and you're going to respond to them separately or thinking about them separately, but you'll be thinking about them in conjunction with each other, hopefully, and thinking about how they speak to each other, sometimes 
questioning each other, answering a question, sometimes they are in direct um, dialogue with each other. Um, but sometimes you might have to make your own connections. You may you may not see an obvious dialogue, um, but it's good critical thinking to try to understand how these different, seemingly very different topics at times do indeed relate to one another. Um, we will hopefully hold our questions to the very end if you have something that's absolutely burning. Um, you know, you you can raise your hand. We do ask you that you use the hand raise function feature and don't just blurt things out. There are over 140 of you. We will not be able to figure out who's talking if you just start talking. So do raise your hand and we'll do our best to manage it. But we think it's ideal to wait till the end be precisely because it will be easier to make connections between the various talks if you've heard them all already. Um, I want to, you know, of course, we have a really interesting lineup today, but I want to give you just a, a sort of glimpse into the future too. what's coming up. So today, you know, talking about how we think and collaborate, which is incredibly important, especially um, with these sort of new um, challenges on the horizon. Uh, next week, we'll be talking and thinking about identity formation, divisions and mechanisms. Um, the following week, uh, July 31st, reproductions and machine consciousness. Um, the the penultimate week, August 7th, what it means to be human, and our final week, August 14th, improving human capacity. Do be sure to come having completed any of the readings, all of the readings that are assigned for that week, and make sure to, to submit your assignments in a timely way. This is, you know, a one credit pass fail course. It's not, it should not be difficult to pass the course. Um, but one sure way not to pass the course is to fail to do the assignments or to not show up. So, you know, it's a, it's it's not meant to be, it's, you know, meant to be a sort of gentle and encouraging introduction to college. Um, but don't don't push those boundaries because we want you all to come away with that credit. It's actually such a, a, a brilliant idea for you all, hopefully because you learn so much, you get a taste of things, but also because that credit actually can put you a bit ahead of other people when it comes to registration. Registration is done by credit hours. And yet you'll be a co cohort of, I guess, 140 or so who have perhaps one extra credit compared to everyone else. So if you need extra incentive to just, I know it's summer, I know it's your you know, last summer before college, but make sure to, to do those readings, get the assignment in and uh, make sure you get that credit because it can actually be quite valuable for registration. Um, I think I've covered any everything. Are there any, not questions about the material, but any logistical questions before we hand it over to our panelists? Great. If you have any questions, you could reach out to, to either, oh, okay, so this is just somebody coming into the waiting room. You can reach out to either me or to Dr. Smith. We're happy to answer any questions. Um, about the course, any logistical questions. Um, I also will say, and I'll say this at the end too, uh, you know, I've often come across students who are in the summer course later on, some some of whom are juniors now, I think even seniors at this point. And, you know, they come for pre-law advising or they end up being one of my courses or they end up as a political science major. I'm always really pleased to talk to someone who I've met, and I'm sure Dr. Smith feels the same way you've met through this introductory course. Do not hesitate to, to reach out, to come by, to, to, to visit, to ask any questions um, in a way. You'll have your advisor, but in a way, I, I feel like all of you, you know, it's, this is sort of your first class. And, I, you know, I think most many of the professors would feel the same way. We're here for you if we can ever um, be any help. Do not hesitate to reach out. At this point, I do want to hand it over to our just absolutely brilliant panel. I'll allow them to introduce um, them, themselves one by one. Um, they all bring very um, just different but amazing kinds of expertise, and I think you'll find the way that that is woven together to be to be fascinating. Um, who should I hand it over to? Who's going to take up the reins first from the panel? I'll take care of it, Andrew. Per perfect. This is it. I'm taking over. Oh my gosh! This this is it. <laughs> it's your show. Incredible power. All right, my friends. Hey. Um... Hi, my name is Satyan Devadas. I'm a mathematician here at USD. I grew up, uh, I was born and raised in India, grew up mostly outside Chicago. I'm a Midwest kid for most of my life. And then I've lived in the East Coast for about 15 years. And I came to USD about five or six years ago. So California, Southern California is new to me, but San Diego is, you know, a little bit of heaven. So it's 
crazy to complain about anything here. Um, first of all, I don't know how your Wi-Fi is at home. Some of you in your bedrooms or wherever you can find a little corner of life to survive in the summer. But if you feel like, you know, a thousand kids on video feed is draining and it's kind of hard to listen with your video on, at least from my talk, feel free to turn off your videos because let's be honest, you're here for this, right? Like this is the money face. So don't worry about it. And I know we're going to do a breakout session later with me and with a different faculty and you can turn on the videos and I really want to see and get to know who you guys are personally. But if you feel like um, it's just hard to to listen with videos on, and especially if the Wi-Fi is kind of pulling you down and it's kind of choppy, feel free to turn it off. Keep it on as much as you want, but I just want to give you guys the freedom to do that. Um, okay, so let me start. First of all, in full honesty, I don't really know about AI. I mean, what do I know? So my title is about AI and math and blah, 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 blah. So I'm just going to be talking about math and I'm going to give you an idea of what I think this notion of AI or machine learning or all these other words might be like. And I certainly want to give you a perspective through the lens of a mathematician. Okay, that's my goal today. Um, if you're hanging out with me later today from like 12 to 1 for the breakout or 1 to 2, we can kind of dig deep more, get to know each other as friends, and we can talk more about that stuff. But my main idea is just to give all of you just a glimpse of the stuff. So, you know, today when we talk about the word math, just as we think about those words, if you're sitting in the subway, um, if you're on a bus, it happens to me when I'm flying uh, on planes just to give talks and stuff. The moment somebody finds out I'm a mathematician, the first words out of their, I mean, dude, I'm not even kidding. The first words out of their mouths are, you must be smart. They just think I'm just a smart person just because I do math. It's amazing, right? If I was a historian, if I was a plumber, an architect, they're like, oh, cool, man, you're an architect. That's awesome. Like, what have you done? But they say, oh, I'm a mathematician. Oh, you're a mathematician. Oh, dude, you're smart. Like somehow there's a notion that math is deeply connected to smartness. But at the same time, having sat next to so many people and bugged them over the years, I asked them, what do you think I do? Like, what is, I know you think I'm brilliant, but like, what do I do? And then this is the funny part. Most of the time, people think that I think about equations and formulas all the time. Do you guys, do you guys know like the Pythagorean theorem from old school, like A squared plus B squared, or like the quadratic formula, like square root of, blah, all, some of you are getting nauseous right now. I get it. Like all of those kind of weird things. Most people think that that's what mathematicians do. If you've even tasted calculus in high school, maybe you take like integrals or derivatives and you just think like, oh, dude, you do like a lot of calculations. I know we did like Pythagorean theorem, but what if you have like the square root of the square root of the square root? Like, that's crazy, right? So like somehow you think like math becomes really complicated when I'm talking to people in the subway or on the plane. And, you know, if you think about that along with what machines are made for, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, the notion of a computer and a calculator literally does what math is kind of thought to be, which is just calculate things, right? A computer computes these things. Not once, gosh, I can't even remember the last time I was at a checkout at a grocery store. And you know, you have to like um, give them the right change. So they give the right change back. Or sometimes you're given a Visa card and you're like, oh my gosh, what's the 10% bill? And you have to calculate all this. I suck at calculations. I'm really bad. I'm so bad at numbers. I'm not, my family never allowed to keep score. Like when we play board games or card games, it's could be because I cheat, but it also could be just because I just can't do these things in my head because we have calculators that do this thing. You just take out your phone, you can calculate this thing. So why am I doing this in my head when I can do these other things that are more fun rather than just compute? So if you think about math as just this like machine of people just calculating and computing, computers would have completely put us out of jobs. Like we would have no jobs right now because calculators would take care of this. Computers would take care of this. They're amazing machines. In fact, your phone can calculate, what, a trillion calculations per second, per minute, some crazy amount of this thing. So the notions of calculations are gone. And so let me just tell you a little bit. I want to spend maybe five minutes of my time just to share with you what mathematicians do so then I can then tell you what AI and math and all this stuff has to do with each other. So here's what we do. Very few of us care about calculations, right? Most of us don't care about that. Computer scientists might care about it. If you want to build something, engineers care about it. If you want to make something, scientists care about it. But mathematicians, man, none of those things get us excited. What we really love is to find out truths. Like what is true? That's all we care about. Like we care about truths. That's it. 
And so we don't want to necessarily calculate things about truth or explore things about truth, but just we want to use logic to find out what is true. So let me give you an idea. Do you know, have you heard of the, the words theory of gravity? Right. Or, you know, quantum theory or quantum mechanics. If you talk about physicists and scientists and biologists, they have all of these theories, like the theory of evolution, right? Kind of a well-known theory that everybody has nowadays that you've heard of. Mathematicians, we don't have theories, we have theorems. In other words, we don't have to pretend that we're thinking what truth is. We know what truth is. Mathematicians are totally and absolutely arrogant. It's amazing, right? So let me give you an example. Newton thought that if you drop an apple, because of the weight of gravity, it pulls the apple down. And he came up with this Newtonian way of thinking about gravity. And then years later, Einstein comes along and says, you know what? Newton almost had it right, but he's off a little bit. It's actually, gravity is not just this one equation. It has to do with mass and the curvature of how time and space are related. So Einstein kind of updated Newton's theory and said Newton was actually wrong. He didn't get it fully right. And nowadays we're thinking about something called string theory. And we think that one day we're going to actually put Einstein in the wrong and talk about the notion of space and time using these vibrating strings of 10 to the negative 23rd size, super small. Scientists need to keep updating their theories because what they have are experimental data that they soak in. Mathematicians, oh my gosh, I love my job. We don't have to worry about any data. Let me give you a simple example, right? Anybody know, have you heard of this thing? That the sum of the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees? Do you guys remember this from like geometry class? Like the three sides add up to like 90 plus 60 plus 30, whatever. That is not a guess. That is not because we sat around and measured a bunch of triangles. And one day somebody might find a new triangle that proves us wrong. And we have to update the theory. We just know, right? I can prove to you that the sum of the triangles are 180 degrees without even looking at triangles. So if you come up with a new triangle in the world, if you go to Mars, if you go somewhere else and find a triangle, I guarantee it's 180 degrees without even having to think about experimentation, having to think about measuring. I just know this truth. So we don't need to have theories. We just know these things to be absolute truth. Okay, so let me give you an example. Instead of triangles, and about formulas and equations about something that mathematicians have been struggling with. And even today, we're still struggling with a little bit. So here is, when I talk about truths, a real mathematical truth. All right. So any questions before I move ahead? Hazel, I see you. Any questions for me? Madeline, any questions for me? Awesome. Good. Caitlin, you happy? Good. Awesome. Anything? No thoughts? Okay, so mathematicians, although we think about theories, we don't think about formulas, we don't think about equations, we're thinking about these kind of ideas of truths. Here's a question. It started in 1850, and the question is about Crayola crayons. So I grew up in India, we never had Crayola crayons. I came to America. I'm not sure we didn't, we were not rich enough to afford a 64 box of Crayola crayons. Have you ever, y'all opened a 64 box of Crayola crayons, the one with the sharpener in the back? It smells phenomenal. It is so good. 64 colors. Like well, I could afford four when I was a kid, right? When I came from India and that was on a good day. So 64, it's amazing. So here's the question it's about Crayola crayons. Somebody gives you a map of America, right? Six, forget the two extras. If you're from Alaska and Hawaii, forgive me. But like, you know, you have the 48 contiguous states, right? Somebody gives you a map and here are the rules. The rules are each state gets its own color. Okay. Each state has to have a full color. So you can't like color California half red and half blue. You have to color the whole thing in one color. That's rule number one. Rule number two, if two states are touching each other, they have to have colors. Okay. So Arizona is next to California. You can't color them both red. Cool. That's rule number two. And the question is, how many colors do you need to color the states in America? right? In the 48 states. Now, if each state has its own color, you've used 48 Crayola crayons, right? That's cool. But if you think about it, can I color those states of America with less than 48 colors? And you could think, wait a minute, California is not touching Maine, right? So whatever California is, I could use the same color that Maine is being used 
So then now you've only used 47 colors, right? Because they're still, California's red, Maine is red. They're not next to each other. So I can still use those colors over there. Totally good. Can I do it with 46 colors? Can I do it with 45 colors? Like what's the least number of Crayola crayons I can have in my pocket? So that for America, there's some way to color every state, one of my four colors or one of my five colors or one of my 10 colors so that each state has its own color and two states that are touching each other have to have different colors. Does that make sense, my friends? So if you think about that for a second, and if you fool around with it, if I just sit there and draw it, it'll take me like eight colors to do it, or maybe seven colors on a good day. But it turns out, y'all are smart, it only needs four for America. All right, US only needs four colors. So you don't need 64, you only need four colors. So let me actually, I've never done this before, but I think, if this blows up somebody's Zoom, forgive me, but I'm gonna share a whiteboard and see if I can do this thing. All right, so um, presenting. All right, so if I am, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, let me see if I can draw this thing. Okay. Casey, is that cool? Can you see this, my friend? Okay, awesome, great. Okay, so here's my country. Uh, forget the entire country. All I'm going to do is look at the percentage from one state. So I'm just looking at my entire life from one state. So here is whatever state you want, right? Let's pretend this is um, Illinois, right? Cool. I need a color for Illinois. So here's my color number one. Cool. Now, what if this state is touching just one other state? So here's Illinois. And it's There's only one other state all around it that's touching it, right? So then now this has to have color number two. So I need at least two colors from the perspective of one state. Cool. So if this is the way my life is from the perspective of Illinois, where I grew up, there's only one state around it. I need at least two colors. But what if instead of um, one state touching it, there were two states touching it like this, right? So now Illinois is touching the state over here and the state over here. Now, if you think about this, I need to have a color here because it can't be number one because it's the same as this one. This has to be different. But look at this state over here. Do you guys see that it's touching two and it's touching one, right? So then it has to be a new color because it can't be the same as one and it can't be the same as two. So now if I have two states touching it, you need three colors, great. Okay, what if there are four states touching it? Like here's one state, here's two states, here's three states, and here's the fourth state, right? The center state with three all around it. Well, look, you need two for this one. You need three for this one, because look, this is touching two and it's touching one. And look at this one, what does this have to do? This is nuts because it's touching one, it's touching two and it's touching three. So now I need four colors. Right. So you're going to have something where you might need all four colors around a state. Now let's keep going. What if there's another four states touching this thing? Well, this is touching two. This is touching three. This thing now. Wait a minute. This thing now actually can be two. Right. And this thing now can be three. In fact, the more stuff you put around it, you might not need more than four colors. In fact, if I just keep hacking at this thing and adding new stuff, you see that I can put four. And if I just, you know, cut this up here. I can also put four and get away with it. So even around one state, no matter how you cut up all the states around it, you will only need at most four. You will never need more than four around one state. Cool. Good. And so the idea is around one state, you'll ever need four. But if you think about America, the problem is California is touching Arizona, but Arizona is touching New Mexico, and New Mexico is touching Utah, and then Utah. So eventually, what happens if there's like a chain reaction? Like the state of coloring one somehow like propagates, and then the color red in California eventually is going to mess you up, and eventually you need some other color in New Mexico, which is going to force you to Florida to some other color. Yeah, around each state, you'll only need four, but what about everything total? And so here's the cool thing that began this crazy adventure. In 1850, this question was asked. And mathematicians believed, not for America, but for any map you could ever draw in the history of the world. You just go and draw a map of Mars. You can talk to the Lord of the Rings and draw a map. You can talk about Narnia. You can map, draw any map in the world, and you will only ever need four. So this is called the four-color conjecture. People thought you only needed four forever. Mathematician tried it, and it wasn't Pythagorean theorem stuff. It wasn't triangulations you're measuring. Nobody's going to sit around and draw every map imaginable because that's infinitely many. You're going to go nuts. So we are trying to use math logic and truth to try to find out whether it's true. Is it true that every map in the world only needs four colors? Any map ever in existence in anybody's imagination, you only need four Crayola crowns. That's it. Oh my gosh, this is a great thing. 1850, people tried this. They realized really quickly that there's an old result 100 years ago by this guy named Euler from 1750 that guarantees you only need six. 
Okay, that's cool. So already people knew you only you could use this amazing result to know only need six. Now check this out. That means any map ever, I guarantee you, you only need six crayons and you get away with it for free. That's sweet, but you want to knock it down to four. Huge question. Mathematicians thought about this for a while. In 1880, 30 years later, after this question was first posed in 1850, this guy said, I did it. Okay. And it turned out he did it. He proved it. He showed it to the world. People thought it was great. And then people found a mistake. So it turned out he wasn't able to do the four color. He was only able to do five colors. So his trick was able to knock it down from six to five, but four was still magical. Fast forward, you guys ready for this? A hundred years in 1976, you're in Illinois, you're in the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which is one of these like big schools, U of I. Two mathematicians at that time, Apple and Haken, said they did it. They were able to prove the four color theorem. And here's what they did. They used a computer for it. And this computer, they, the computer tested hundreds of thousands of cases. It's complicated. I don't want to get into this right now, but the supercomputer was able to reduce thousands of these cases, basically like 1900 massive cases to evaluate and guarantee that only four colors are needed. Mathematicians hated this. We totally couldn't stand this result because we didn't know why it was true. We believed them. We didn't think the computer was lying. We believed it, but we just didn't believe why it was true. We didn't understand it. My friends, even today, right now in 2023, there is not a proof of the four color theorem. It is called a theorem. It is absolutely true, but there's not a proof of this theorem without computers. Even today, we need a computer to convince you that four colors are enough. But in 1976, half the mathematicians walked out and said, this is not math. This is total idiocy. But now in 2023, every mathematician is on board. We wish we found a way to do it without computers, but that's the best we got today. So here's a mathematical result that I know needs computers to make it work. And after 50 years, mathematicians are kind of comfortable with computers. It's really weird, but it took us that long. So... We could talk more about this a little bit. And certainly I want to have you guys think about this while we talk about the Q&A stuff. But let me just close my time with talking about the arts and the humanities, okay? Mathematicians, when people think math, mathematicians are smart, I think we are. But we're really good about thinking deeply about very dumb things. Listen, we're talking about triangles, Right. Have you ever thought about a triangle? It might, like the Pythagorean theorem, do you guys know what the Pythagorean theorem is about? It's about 90 degree triangles. It's not even about triangles, it's about 90 degree triangles. Out of the complexity of your life about issues of race and injustice, about issues of gender, about issues of truth and meaning, about issues of what it means to be human today, you are talking about triangles? Like, are you out of your mind? And that's what math does. It talks about Crayola crayons and coloring maps. Like, we are not that smart. We're really smart about really stupid things. So that's what math is. And because of it, computers are our friends because computers are dumb and we're dumb. So we kind of get together and dance, right? Like all they can do is kind of do these dumb calculations. It's called machine learning. Basically, it learns about what it learned about what it learned about. And mathematicians are kind of dumb about the kind of things we care about. Do you guys know what the quadratic formula is about? It's about a parabola. That's it. Like that square root of plus or minus square. Like it's just literally about a parabola. That's all a quadratic formula is. So it's not amazing that you know it. It's just about a stupid curve. Like you come to USD and all of a sudden these classes you talk about is anthropology. Like what does it mean to think about culture over space and time? Sociology. Like what does it mean to impact a culture right now? You could talk about philosophy. You could talk about architecture. You could talk about art history. I mean, the complexity of what you're dealing with is crazy. Or you can take my math class, which is like triangles. Triangles in space, curves, right? It's the complications not there. So math is the first line of attack for computer get together and hang out with faculty because we talk about dumb things and computers are designed for it. What ChatGPT did, and there's another program, for example, that I really like called MidJourney. What it did was it started taking these ideas that mathematicians knew and this kind of simple stuff, and it started bringing it to the arts and the humanities. And the arts and the humanities, what they do is deal with really hard things. They, they talk about images, right? They talk about what it means to write. They talk about poetry. My true belief is that let's not, let's forget about ethics. Let's forget about embodiment. Let's forget about the fact that the cell phone is the work of a devil. We can talk about that later. Let's just leave all that stuff alone. I'm just talking about from an academic side. 
this notion of this new AI stuff is actually going to make the arts and the humanities better. That's my true belief. Because right now, it's really creepy, and we're not ready for it yet. But just like mathematicians weren't ready for it yet in the 1970s, it took us 50 years, and now we get it. And it makes sense to us. And computation in math has not died. It has only grown. And mathematician has not gotten weaker, has gotten more powerful. So to me, in time, we'll figure out what this is. And it's going to make a poet write better poetry. It's going to make an artist and a filmmaker make better films. It's not going to replace them. But we figured out yeah, because we're right at the entrance to this world. So those are my mumblings for it. I'm excited to hang out with you guys later. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker. But before I do that, any questions or comments about this particular thing that I was, that was kind of unclear as we kind of process it for the other three talks? Caitlin, you happy? I'm just going to pick on you because I see you right in the middle of my screen. Awesome. If Caitlin is happy, I am happy. Okay, great. Thank you all. Okay, who's up next? Jen, are you up next or... I'm up okay. next. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, Dr. David. That was an awesome talk. Tough act to follow. All right. So um, same thing goes. You can leave your cameras on, turn your cameras off. Either way, it doesn't matter to me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. So my name is Dr. Jen Wenzel. I am a neuroscientist and the neuroscience major um, in the Department of Psychological Sciences. And so today I'm going to talk about AI and its interfacing with neuroscience and what neuroscience can tell us about the current capabilities of AI and this human computer interaction. And why I came up with this talk, why I wanted to talk about this is uh, these recent headlines that just came out in May uh, talking about the capabilities of AI to potentially read our minds. So AI makes non-invasive mind reading possible. Uh, goodbye privacy, AI's next terrifying advancement is reading our minds. So this is pretty scary stuff. And uh, as a neuroscientist, when I read this, I think, ha ha ha, <laughs> we do not know enough about the human mind for robots to read it yet. And we're going to talk about that today. So I'm going to talk about the complexity of the human brain just a little bit. And this is something we talk about in neuroscience a lot. So unlike math, like Dr. Davidos was talking about, we just don't have the tools to know everything about the human brain. It is incredibly, incredibly complicated. And as we develop new tools to study these things that we can't see with the naked eye, that we can't possibly know without the tools necessary, um, you know, then we can't know it until we have the tools we need. And as we invent new tools, we learn new things and they might invalidate previous things we thought we knew. We're also going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about what we've learned from AI by applying it to neuroscience uh, questions. We've actually learned a lot by using artificial intelligence in neuroscience. And finally, we'll talk about how this relates and if AI is even close to reading our minds just yet. All right, so first, the complexity of the human brain. So the human brain has these basic principles, right? What the brain does is it takes in sensory information, so things like touch, sight, taste, smell, hearing, pain, and then it computes it somehow inside the brain, this kind of black box, and this leads to some sort of output, which we say is behavior. It's motor output. So for instance, if you're looking in your fridge and you see some leftovers, you might take those leftovers out, give them a sniff. Your brain's going to process that smell information. Are these leftovers still good? And if they are, you know, you think, oh, that smells pretty good. Then your behavior might be to go ahead and eat those leftovers. So this is kind of the basics of the brain. We take in information from our environment. The brain processes those sensory um, signals, and then it leads to some sort of motor output or behavior. But there's also a lot of things that happen inside the brain. The brain has a lot of intrinsic activity as well things that aren't directly related to sensory input or motor output, things like your thoughts, your dreams, your desires, your emotions, your personality. These things aren't necessarily inputs and outputs, right? They're things that happen inside the brain. Within the brain itself, the brain is made up of a lot of cells. These cells are neurons and glial cells, and there's a lot of different types of neurons and a lot of different types of glial cells, and we talk about that in neuroscience uh, here at USD a lot. These cells are connected together by these little connections called synapses. And it's believed in neuroscience that these synapses are really the substrates of all of these processes of the brain. So decoding of sensory information, creation of motor output, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, your motivations, your dreams have to do with this information passing 
from cell to cell at the level of the synapse. Well, the human brain is very, very, very complex. There are about 171 billion cells, billion cells. This includes neurons and glial cells. And each neuron might have hundreds or thousands of these connections with other cells. So hundreds to thousands of synapses on each of these 171 billion cells. So there are likely over a hundred trillion synapses in the brain. And if I'm telling you that this information flow across synapses, these connections between cells in the brain is somehow encoding your thoughts, your desires, your feelings, your motivations, your sensations, your motor output, well, there's a hundred trillion places where that could be happening at any given time, right? So it's incredibly, incredibly complex. And just to give you an idea of this number, a hundred trillion, it would take over 300,000 years of continuous counting for someone to count to a hundred trillion. So it's quite literally impossible for any given human to try and study all of these synapses, right? It's an absolutely giant number. Neuroscience itself is a relatively recent field. It really wasn't until around the 1950s, which is 70 years ago, which you guys may be thinking was a long time ago, but in the grand scheme of things, it's really not. There are people alive, your grandparents, who lived before a lot of these discoveries we're talking about. So it's a really uh, new field, and it really wasn't until the 50s that we had the tools necessary to measure the communication that's happening at these synapses. So neuroscience is a very, very new science. And even back then they had these giant tools. This is an electron microscope. This is an oscilloscope used to measure electrical activity at these synapses. And then really neuroscience is exploding in the last couple decades. We've been developing these cutting edge tools, these really new tools that help us to learn more and more about the brain and these synaptic connections and what's happening within the brain. For instance, this is an MRI machine. Uh, which you may have heard about. And this is a technique we can use in animals called optogenetics, which we can talk more about in the study section if you want to. So using these techniques over the last seven years, we've learned a lot about the brain. We have learned a lot, particularly about sensory systems. We've learned a lot about vision. We've learned a lot about audition or hearing. We've learned a lot about sensations and touch information. We've learned a lot about how that information comes into the brain and how it's processed into the brain. And then we've learned also a lot about the motor system, meaning how the brain sends signals to our muscles to make us do particular movements. We've learned a lot about this. Now, a lot remains unknown. It's certainly not well-known information, but we've got some textbook knowledge, which I like to say is really known enough and shown enough in enough research that we can put it in a textbook, textbook knowledge. What we don't know a lot about still is how the brain generates thoughts and emotions and motivations, desires, things we like, things we don't like, memories, these things that we can't see, these things that don't have a physical input like photons, light into the eyes, these things that don't have a physical output like a behavior, a movement. We know significantly less about these things. We're learning a lot about them, but they're difficult to study. And so although we know a lot about the brain, there's still a lot that remains unknown. And most of what remains unknown are these things that contribute, how the brain makes up our thoughts and our emotions, our desires, et cetera. All right, so I think it touched a little bit on how complex the human brain is. And I'm sure we could talk a whole semester about the complexity of the human brain, uh, but just a little taste there. Now I'd like to talk about how AI is helping neuroscientists kind of sort through this complexity to find meaning, meaningful neural signatures or, or signs in the brain. And so remember when I said that it would take someone over 300,000 years of counting to count to 100 trillion? Well, it turns out a computer can do this way, way faster. And my point here is that a computer, artificial intelligence, has the ability to survey this massive amount of information much faster than a human can, much like Dr. Davidos was talking about before me. A computer has the ability to go through these calculations, to look through these data that we collect much faster than a human could potentially do it. 
And so uh, given what humans have learned about the brain, we can actually train computers, we can train computer programs or algorithms to identify relevant patterns in brain data. So we can collect a lot of brain data, we can tell computer programs what to look for, meaning given what we know about the rules of how the brain works, what is relevant data to look for, and then the computer can go through a dense data set that a human could never possibly have the time to sort through. And so there's a lot of different ways that we can collect this neural data. We can do this in animals by implanting an electrode into their brain to collect electrical information about this activity at these synapses. We can also do it in humans. We can collect data in humans non-invasively. Not a lot of humans want an electrode implanted into their brain, but we can put them in an MRI and get fMRI or functional uh, imaging data on brain activity patterns while they're doing a task. Um, we can also do external recording. So you may have seen someone wearing a cap with electrodes, that's called EEG. Uh, and then in some cases, humans may have a brain implant if they have some sort of neurological disorder or brain surgery for another region, reason, they may get um, an implant or an array of electrodes placed directly on the brain. That's very rare. But regardless of how this data is collected, these data are very dense, right? You could be recording over thousands or millions of neurons at a time, meaning that there is you know, hundreds of thousands, millions and millions of synaptic, uh, of synaptic uh, inter innervations activities going on at the same time. Way too much data for a human to decode. And so that's where AI comes in. And using AI, uh, scientists have developed a lot of very cool tools, very, very cool tools. One of these tools is called a brain computer interface or the ability of someone to interface with a computer with their brain. So typically in a brain com computer interface, a person may be like a quadriplegic that is not able to move their arms or legs and potentially may be locked in and unable to speak as well. They may get some brain implants or electrodes implanted into the brain, and then using artificial intelligence to decode these electrical impulses or the synaptic activity in their brain to actually interact with a computer screen. So for instance, this individual is imagining writing the word hello. It's, he's just imagining it. He is unable to move. And that pops up on the screen because the AI is able to decode the brain signals in this human's brain when they imagine writing the word hello. Now, like I said before, we know a lot more about motor uh, information in the brain, meaning we know a lot about how the brain creates movements like writing. And so this is a bit of an easier, not easy, but still easier message to decode. There's also brain machine interfaces. And this is when patients are implanted with electrodes in their brain again, that allows them to interact with a machine rather than with a computer. So in a brain machine interface, again, a person may be quadriplegic, unable to move their arms or legs, and they have an implant in their brain that can read these synaptic signals, AI decodes them, and uses those signals to move usually a prosthetic limb. So in this example here, a woman cannot move her arms, but she has this implant here, and the AI is decoding her brain activity and causing the movement of this robotic arm to pick up a drink and bring it to her lips so that she can have some of this motor autonomy through this uh, brain machine interface. Well, this is really exciting. I mean, this is incredibly exciting work and I'd say it's at the forefront of our neuroscience AI um, or our use of AI in neuroscience research, uh, but there are a lot of caveats. So. Individuals' brains vary quite a bit. So just because, you know, in my brain, that's this area right here is exactly where I'm processing this information. In your brain, it might be a little bit different, not hugely different, but micrometers can make a big difference. Computer programs have to train on individuals' brain signals for weeks or months in order to decode information. So in the case of a brain-computer interface, or a brain machine interface, they have to train on an individual's brain, brain information for quite some time. And people also have to learn how to interact with AI. It's not perfect and it takes practice. 
There are also tool limitations. For instance, do you want an electrode implanted in your brain? Probably not, right? So this is all with uh, invasive techniques. These people are suffering from quadriplegia, so they're probably willing to get an implant in order to use a prosthetic limb. But chances are people that aren't suffering from quadriplegia or some other neurological disorder don't want an implant in their brain. And unlike implants, which can measure from, you know, probably tens to maybe a hundred neurons and synapses at a time, if you use a less invasive technique, like a cap that goes outside the skull, outside the hair, or an MRI, they sum from millions of neurons at a time. So they have much lower resolution. And so that's why we're not really close to having things like RoboCop at this time. Uh, we're quite far away from it. There are a lot of caveats involved. But we have accomplished some truly amazing things. And I'm a tad short on time, but we can take a look at the beginning of this video. Let's see if we can get it to come up. So they're speaking up well. For more than a decade, Gert Jan Oskam has been trying to relearn to walk. A motorbike accident in his late 20s left him paralyzed from the hips down, changing his life forever. But now, Oskam is back on his feet thanks to groundbreaking digital implants in his brain and his spine. After two days, within five to 10 minutes, I could control my uh, hips. It works like this. When Oscom thinks about taking a step, a brain implant picks up the signals and sends them to a computer strapped to his back. The computer decodes it, then transmits the signal to a device in his spinal cord, triggering his legs to move. Scientists say it's like a digital bridge that bypasses the damaged part of his spine. The patient has first to learn how to work with his brain signals, and we also have to learn how to correlate this brain signal to the spinal cord stimulation. Scientists were shocked to find it may have helped close the gap in his nervous system. I'm here. Yeah. In less than a year. So pretty amazing stuff using AI to decode those brain signals and then send stimulation to his muscles so he can walk. So absolutely amazing and something that would be possible without the use of artificial intelligence. All right. So to move on to this teaser, right? Can AI read your mind? So these are these scary headlines I talked about at the, at the, uh, at the beginning of the lecture. So what I want to ask you guys to think is, oh, what do you think of when you hear that a machine could read your mind? What would it need to know? What would it need to know for you to think, oh, it can read my mind? Does anybody want to share what they think? Caitlin, I'm going to pick on you. Would you be willing to? Oh, uh, sure. I guess my thoughts um, on a given second. Yeah, right. Your thoughts, right? What what you're thinking about? Like, oh, what am I thinking of right now? Right? Like a magician. Exactly. Thank you so much. Well, this is what this is the paper that was published that um, motivated those headlines. This is a paper from Nature Neuroscience. It's a really high impact journal, well respected journal. Semantic reconstruction of continuous language from non-invasive brain recordings. Oh, wow, that's a lot. Let's talk about what they did. So participants, so study subjects came in and they listened to 16 hours of podcast stories in an fMRI scanner. So we looked at their brain activity while they listened to 16 hours worth of stories. And then AI, a program trained on their brain activity during each story. And then during the test, the AI decoder could identify language from the stories from their participants' brain activity. So they, the, um, F, the AI trained on their brain signals while they listened to the stories, and then they came back and they thought about uh, saying the stories and the decoder decoded them. And the decoder wasn't perfect. So for instance, if they said something like, I got up from the air mattress and pressed my face against the glass of the bedroom window, expecting to see eyes staring back at me, but instead, finding only dark, darkness, if they imagine saying those words, the decoder decoded these words. I just continued to walk up to the window and open the glass. I stood on my toes and peered out. I did not see anything and looked up again. I saw nothing. So similar in gist, but not identical, right? And so what are they doing here? Well, they're capitalizing on this idea 
are, are they're capitalizing on the fact that we know a lot about motor output and the motor system and how the brain encodes motor signals. So the AI trained on them listening to the stories and then they produced the same speech or they thought the same motor pattern and the AI decoded that. So we're really capitalizing on how much we know about speech, a motor behavior. And still, this is quite impressive, but it's probably not what you guys thought when you thought about AI reading your mind, imagining what you're saying. So it's probably not what you consider mind reading, but it's still impressive. The decoder could use fMRI data to identify these neural signatures of phrases from a finite number of stories that the AI was trained on. But if participants thought about anything else but the stories that were being presented, they could easily trick the idea and the decoder wouldn't work. So if they thought about anything else at all, the decoder would not work because the decoder could only decode information that it was familiar with, meaning from those 16 hours where they listened to those stories. If they thought about anything else, then it wouldn't work at all. And so this probably isn't quite what you're we expecting with mind reading. Um, so the take home message is that we know a lot about the brain, but there's still a lot more to learn. And while AI informs neuroscience, neuroscience must also inform AI. AI cannot have the capability, AI doesn't have the capabilities to make discoveries that human neuroscientists haven't made. Sure, it can look through data and find patterns, but human neuroscientists have to know what patterns to look for, what patterns are meaningful, what the rules of the brain are through experiments. Oops. Scientific knowledge is knowledge that's gained by observation. So by definition, scientific knowledge is empirical evidence, meaning it has to be observed by humans. So if neuroscientists don't yet know how the brain encodes emotions, motivations, thoughts, dreams, et cetera, then how can we train AI to identify neural signatures of these concepts? If we don't know what neural signatures make up a thought, AI cannot know how to identify them. So until neuroscientists discover how the brain encodes these concepts, AI mind reading remains science fiction. So not to be too worried about those headlines that AI could potentially read your mind. So AI, while it's invaluable to help us learn more things about the brain, it can only learn things based upon what we tell the AI, the AI is relevant to learn. All right, so that's it for me. Does anybody have any specific questions before I pass it off to the next person? Hi, that's me. I'm Julie Morgan. Thanks, everyone. Um, this is awesome. Um, really great talk so far. I was very excited to hear about specifically about plasticity of the brain. Um, although I do have a little point of contention uh, with you, Setian, about uh, cell phone being the work of the devil, but we can go offline with that, I think. Um, I'm Julie. I work at uh, when I'm not here being a professor, I work at Qualcomm as a user experience designer, and I am here to talk today a little bit about AI and design thinking um, and kind of introduce you to design thinking as a concept. In the 13th century, uh, we're starting way back when, the Benedictine monks of Nurusha developed something called a mechanical clock. It's a tool designed to help keep track of prayer times throughout the day for their order. And it was uh, used to solidify the monks' religious devotion and intensify their relationship with God. Benedictines lived a life of solitude, of humility uh, and service, and really was inspired by St. Benedict's desert monasticism uh, portrayed here by Friar Angelico. This is uh, from the 15th century. And through this, just a fair warning, um, I have a history and art history, so you may see a couple of art pieces come up here. But before the mechanical clock, like other medieval folks, the monks used something called a sundial. And they practiced a rhythm of life in tune with the rising and setting sun. People used to glance at the sundial to know 
how much light was left in a day to complete their activities. The problem though with this approach, according to the senior monks running the Benedictine order was that the junior monks would lose track of time and forget to pray, usually because they were consumed with other things like cooking or eating or gardening, um, mending clothes, etc. Now, with the invention of the mechanical clock, the monks established a new rhythm of life. Prayer time was precisely scheduled. The seven times of devotion during the day, they were integrated in daily life. And it was really from this schedule that all other life events revolved. New scheduling served the senior monks well as it allowed them to monitor or check in on the junior monks activities throughout the day. It was kind of a, a medieval surveillance schema, if you will. And in contrast, the sun, with the sundial, the mechanical clock is always moving. The clock really dictated the cadence of the day. The clock, the sun became irrelevant and the clock in a sense scheduled the activities. The clock became the sun. More than just a tool to remind the monks of prayer times, the clock was a technology that fundamentally changed how people behaved and therefore changed the nature of the monks themselves. Soon after the mechanical clock's implementation at the monastery, the Catholic Church realized that this technology, this design, could help control and surveil the behavior, not just of monks, but of entire communities. And during the 14th century, the church began installing clock towers in town squares across Europe, imposing order and reminding the populace of the institution's power over their behavior. The civic design of a centralized clock really transformed communities. The clock tower changed the way people related to their daily tasks and to each other. USD here, of course, has a clock tower on campus next to the, the chapel, chiming every hour to ensure both you and I make it to class on time. The clock changed the underlying relationships between people and their environment their systems, their activities, their cultures, their resources. The invention of the mechanical clock enabled new powerful systems that ordered and controlled human movement. Changing the nature of relationships between humans and their environments is the essence of design. Design shapes behaviors, design toggles the balance of power and often brings about unforeseen consequences the clock case in point. And when we change our relationship with our environmental systems, we transform ourselves in the process. Like the mechanical clock, AI or artificial intelligence or machine learning, they're all kind of used interchangeably. AI has the capability to fundamentally change the relationship between people, their systems and the things around them. Artificial intelligence as a term can be a little misleading, like Sethian said, a, a term can be, our intelligence can be thought of maybe as a, a skilled use of reason, skilled as in having acquired a mastery and reason maybe as a, a rational ground or motive. But algorithms aren't people and don't really have skills or reason per se. Algorithms, AI algorithms have processing power for computations, but there's not real intention or motivation. AI deconstructs experiences to data points and uses these data points to project an interpretation of a behavior or narrative. Think of AI as um, like a, a series of statistical regression models or a system of some folks call stochastic parrots, randomly determining output based on what a human may say or do in data past. ChatGPT, for example, doesn't so much write as it puts together words in a way that has statistically shown to have meaning to people based on other human content that's been generated before and it's training data. It approximates what a response should sound like. AI may be 
better described as sort of this applied statistics versus a, a kind of intelligence. So an AI model may be skilled uh, in artistic endeavors only as it can pull from previously created art, for example. Mid-journey, um, for, for example, doesn't really create art so much as it applies color and shading to work based on the past works of human artists. For example, on the left is a Gaudi's Casa building from 1905. And on the right is work by, generated by Chris Rodley in 2017. A little bit frightening if you ask me. Um, the image was generated using a neural style transfer algorithm. But did AI mean to really create eyes? No, not really. The, the Gaudi design includes these um, Perildolia accents, uh, these kind of shapes that look like eyes. They approximate the eye shape. And AI produced an image based on an algorithm that interpreted these items up here as, the, as eyes, as the shape of eyes. AI models create algorithmic outputs of data. And an AI image is not an outcome of a creative process. The, the visual rendering or meaning or the realization of a specific intention. So it's, it's difficult to describe the generated image as something the AI algorithm made with meaningful or intentional purpose. Indeed, AI algorithms like those with the Captain Cat, Chuddle, Cat Cuddle chatbot here, this is actually my favorite AI implementation of all time, right, they're very good at approximating what has been trained as a reasonable response to an inquiry. In more advanced AI systems, the algorithms can have profound effects on outcomes and can make predictions based on large quantities of data. Uh, as Eric Topol described here uh, in this tweet, he references an AI model that can generate precise diagnoses of valvular disease. It's really remarkable indeed. But there are certain perils in using AI models, particularly in medical applications. So when AI training data is biased against marginal communities, for example, this can skew AI training model predictions. In recent models, because historically, for example, black patients needed to be much sicker to receive care. The AI then parroted these predictions and didn't recommend prompt treatment. The outcome of AI recommendations was a dangerous manifestation of the medical community's past that had a history of underdiagnosing and neglecting or harming black patients. And another example, without accurate information, chat GPT can respond to with something that's called a hallucination. So sometimes chat GPT puts words and, um, and names and ideas together that appear to make sense but actually don't belong together at all, such as in here discussing the world record for crossing the English Channel on foot. The, the response sounds very reasonable, very reasonable, but is absolutely dead wrong. It's false, totally fake information. In addition to hallucinations and biases in the data sets, AI has the potential to drastically shift the power to companies with resources who run LLMs or large language models, they're called. These companies have enormous centralized computational processing. AI models can also watch our location and behaviors. Just as the clock towers in medieval time, towns enabled behavioral changes that allowed more improved surveillance, the data in the AI training models is so precise that models, particularly this dense pose algorithm, can be trained to accurately map human figures through walls using only Wi-Fi routers in your house. Talk about surveillance. Humans have always been radically shaped by the designs they produce. It's the, this is a quote from Are We Human? 
Um, I didn't assign this, but if you guys get this book, it's fantastic. Beatrice Colomina and Mark Wigley. AI is bringing about huge shifts in power structures and forging new surveillance platforms and knowledge communities with biases and underlying data models and misinformation confidently presented as fact. How can we, how can we as mere humans center our needs of today in our designs and our innovations for tomorrow? How can we use AI models as tools to create human-centered experiences versus creating panopticons that enable our servitude. If our tools are both artifacts and the means of recreating ourselves, how do we design ourselves to ensure our own humanity? It can be a wicked problem, something that's multi-layered, expansive in scope and complex in system interconnections. Fortunately, we do have something uh, called design thinking. That's a kind of scientized critical thinking structure um, or, or human-centered process. Um, think of it as kind of a, a, a Trojan horse of humanities into, uh, into uh, an engineering thought processes or a ghost in the machine, maybe. We as designers use something called uh, design thinking. Uh, and, it can be used to kind of scaffold and organize our human creativity. Um, we use techniques that are peripherals to the human experience and can both expand and refine critical thinking. Design techniques can create an appendage of our own mental models rather than a replacement or intelligence of mind. One process that outlines these techniques is called the double diamond design thinking process. There are two distinct face, uh, spaces in the double diamond, the problem space. This is where we try to understand the landscape of issues and the systems integrating into the problem. And the solution space where we sort of look for ways to solve that selected problem, sometimes in concert with other ecosystems as well. Notice in the middle here, there's a, there's a definition space, a place to define and refine a problem statement and the scope we want to address in the solution space. The idea of working with the double diamond structure is to choose the right platform to solve and the right problem to solve, and then to solve that problem right. Within each diamond, we've got two kinds of thinking models, divergent and convergent thinking. Both types of thinking are especially useful in working with volatile, uncertain, complex, or ambiguous environments. In, in the business environment that I'm in, we do that a lot. Um, when we want to explore and cover new problems to solve, we employ divergent thinking, kind of thinking broadly, expansively. When we want to refine our explorations, we use convergent thinking. And we have techniques that can help do this. Used iteratively, not just you know straight line, but again and again, the idea is to get a solution that's good enough, that's close enough, then at each iteration to sort of test and refine with future versions. Here's a few examples of the techniques that we use in each phase of the iterative process. Each technique or method employs either convergent or divergent thinking or both, and it kind of, it really enables designers and stakeholders to get a holistic view of uh, the problem exploration and solution making. For example, let's say we wanted to create a safer space for marginalized people online. How might we do that? We may employ empathy mapping or conduct diary, diary studies to understand how another person may feel about a certain product, service, or community. But empathy goes beyond just feelings, for example. We look for human motivations. We look for pain points within the system and other insights that can offer new paths and experiences and even new products. Take uh, Bumble, for example. When working as a co-founder at a startup called Tinder, Wolf Heard documented both her and other women's harassment on the Tinder platform using empathy mapping and diary studies, listing out a myriad of ways Tinder encouraged microaggression, surveillance, and violence on its platform. Then Herd created Bumble, an app 
where women could give each other compliments and later turned it into a blockbuster dating app with more than 18 million downloads in 2019 alone. She used her own and others' pain points to create a consent platform and in the progress shifted the power dynamics to give women more control over their online interactions. By using a human-centered approach, Bumble found a niche in the market. By the way, Bumble reported uh, $903 million in revenue in 2022, so doing something right. But what about AI, you may ask? What about using AI platforms to inform concepts and decision-making? Well, they, some have used AI as a tool to generate concepts uh, and to synthesize user research analyze competitive landscapes, or even create task analyses of jobs to be done. But I think we should use this with caution. Here's an example of a chat GPT output listing user tasks of an imaginary to-do app. User opens the app, user logs in, user's taken to the main dashboard. Even if we don't consider that AI uses biased data sets or makes stuff up, hallucinates, makes up false information. AI outputs can often be really trivial and boring. Uh, in your readings, you read, you read about how AI models can fill the internet with blah, um, unrecognizable, unrecognizable and unmeaningful in terms of content meant for humans. But when you, when you look under the hood, there's not a lot of extra in AI outputs, only real basic. Design can be many things. Design can be a way to solve problems. Design can be prosthetic, producing new capabilities or appendages to old forms, old ways of doing things. Design can be the rendering of our intentions. Design and design thinking can help make more meaningful experiences to us and to each other and to our surroundings. Design is really the defense of the human. And in design, design reinvents our relationships, our perceptions, our environments. A piece of cloth is a piece of cloth, but it's the way we use the cloth, our intentions behind the action that manifest our designs into the world. With AI bringing huge shifts in power structures and new surveillance program platforms, we can use design thinking to instruct AI to center our human needs and our system integration in our innovations of today that move to tomorrow. Another design thinking process is called liberatory design for equity. This process invites us to see, engage, and act while continuously noticing and reflecting on the impact of design iterations. It is iterative, just like the double diamond. The liberatory design process for equity can, can, can really help designers and stakeholders articulate their vision together in a shared space while centering human needs and including a larger community in the design process. Tanya Anase is one of the founders of liberatory design. Through her Bitna design agency, she worked with the Obama Foundation and Community Leadership Corps to identify problems and solutions for systemic racial inequity. As a liberatory design facilitator, Anase helped the core team apply design thinking principles to connect seemingly unrelated issues. One core team, for example, wanted to find a way to support high schoolers with personal finance skills, but with the right design thinking tools, the teams found a systemic problem, the racial inequities prevalent in financial institutions that really threw up barriers to marginalized communities. Design research and interviews helped bridge that gap between a simple issue and a nuanced, more complex problem. The brainstorming sessions then empowered the teams to explore new ways of looking at old problems and devise novel solutions. Design thinking can help us explore new ways of looking at and remaking old things. 
This is Sundial by Ligia Clark. It's a sculpture and a design with hinged metal sheets that can be folded into different configurations or even flattened out. Clark wanted participants to engage with Sundial, radically defining its relationship with its environment and emphasizing the potential for new form. She called these type of works beach or critters. Like Clark's sundial, design and design thinking techniques can help refine relationships with AI as a framework for human-centered futures, rather than a platform for surveillance or for misinformation distribution. It can help us envision the human impact of our innovations and devise successful outcomes rather than statistically generated outputs. Humans are malleable, adaptable organisms, often indistinguishable from the networks and frameworks that are constructed around us. But we can design our frameworks for good and to serve us and our environments, using design thinking techniques to check our assumptions, evaluate problem spaces, define problem statements, and refine solutions to be more inclusive, accessible, and consensual. Design thinking can help us prevent a clock from becoming the sun, and design thinking can help us solve the right AI problems and solve the AI problems right. That's it. I look forward to our discussions. If you're interested in learning more about design thinking, I am around from one to three, two, two different sessions, one to two, two to three. Um, I also am teaching a class later this fall with my co-instructor, Sadai Avis. Hope to see you there. All right, I believe I am next. Uh, let me just share my screen. All right, so I've I've been really loving all of this. It's It's been so much fun to learn from my colleagues about the really cool ways that, um, you know, AI is being used. Um, so I'm Dr. Casey Mira, and I am an assistant professor in the political science and international relations department, uh, just like Dr. Terrell. Um, my area of focus is East Asia, especially China. So my research focuses on the domestic drivers of, of Chinese foreign policy. Uh, and my interest in China started when I was a Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, so I taught English in rural China for two years. Um, and through that experience, I, I realized that much of what I was seeing firsthand was very different from what I was reading in the news, right? So the, the China that gets presented to us in the news is, is very different uh, from what I saw at least. Um, but today I'll, I'll be discussing AI and the future of international security uh, with a focus on the intensifying tech rivalry between the US and China. And the goal of my talk is really to just encourage you to reflect on and question some of the dominant frameworks that arguably could keep us from collaborating on AI. All right, so from the US's perspective, rapid advances in AI present a range of security challenges. And as Secretary of State Antony Blinken has stated, the US, along with China and other leading world powers, are currently in a race to develop and deploy AI, uh, which as Blinken notes, has the potential to shape our lives you know, from where we get our energy to how we do our jobs to how our wars are fought. Um, and because of this massive potential for AI to shape really all aspects of global politics, the US and China for that matter, have a national interest in being at the forefront of strategic technologies, right? They both have an interest in winning the AI race. And this sentiment is echoed in the official Chinese discourse on AI, including in the 2017 New Generation Artificial Intelligence Development Plan, which informs the core of its AI strategy. Uh, and in this plan, AI is described as a strategic technology that is critical to enhancing national competitiveness and protecting national security. And China's leaders have indeed set the goal of becoming a world leader in AI by 2030. And they see AI as the key for continued economic growth, as well as its ability to move up the value chain in manufacturing, which is necessary for it to become a high income country. 
And this is crucial because it feeds into the need for China's leaders to maintain legitimacy. And their political legitimacy rests on their ability to deliver continued economic growth. Right, so for China, being a leader in AI is not just about national security, but about regime security as well. So what is the state of the US-China competition for AI dominance? Well, given how much is at stake, it's not surprising that China has invested heavily in its AI capabilities. Uh, so this chart here, it, it reflects the emphasis that China has put on research and development. And over the past decade or so, China has far outstripped the US in terms of the number of academic papers on AI that it produces, especially in the areas of image recognition and generation. Um, so this is just, you know, this just reflects the volume of research, but what about quality and actual influence? Well, um, in 2020, for the first time, China overtook the US in terms of AI related academic citation. So the number of times that other researchers have referenced Chinese uh, publication. So this really shows the extent to which China is already challenging the dominance of the US in AI research. Now, in terms of turning ideas into real world entrepreneurship, China still lags behind. Um, and this is especially true with respect to generative AI, right, or AI that is able to produce content. Um, you know, the US continues to pioneer new technologies with OpenAI's ChatGPT as a case in point. But it is worth pointing out that ChatGPT, it was released last November. And by March of this year, Baidu, which is China's leading internet company, uh, released its take on, um, or its version of ChatGPT, known as ErnieBot. Um, you know, the, the rollout of Ernie, it was a bit underwhelming, but Ernie has since adapted and improved. And just a few weeks ago, Chinese researchers announced that Ernie outperformed ChatGPT Chat on a number of tasks, including multiple choice college entrance exams. Oh, sorry. What's going on here? Now, skeptics, though, they, they still do hold that when it comes to generative AI, China has a long way to go. But, but China is widely seen as a leader in, in fields such as uh, image uh, and, and facial recognition, which I'll, which I'll come back to. Um, so perhaps it seems that on balance, right, that the US is winning the so-called arms race against China. Uh, but it is worth questioning whether this framework which today dominates policy circles in DC and Beijing is even appropriate. So this framework, this arms race framework, it harkens back to the Cold War when the US and the Soviet Union were locked in an arms race in which both sides tried to one up the other in building the most nuclear warheads. And you can see here in this chart that the Soviet Union eventually won, um, but at great economic cost, eventually contributing to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Right, so, so maybe there's a lesson in that. Um, but there are two important ways in which technology competition today over AI is completely different from the past. Uh, first of all, competition over AI is not zero sum, right? People around the world can benefit from developments um, in, a, in AI in areas that will promote economic growth and public well being. Um, as, as Dr. Wenzel showed us, right? Scientific advancements here in the US could help paraplegics around the world. Um, but as obvious as this observation is, the anxiety surrounding China's rise often leads policymakers here in the US to forget this. Now, second, uh, what's going on here? This Cold War era framework overlooks the extent to which both countries are technologically dependent on one another. Um, AI is the product of collaboration between scientists, developers, and researchers who do not operate in siloed, isolated environments within their own countries. Uh, both the US and China are part of a globally intertwined ecosystem. And this is very different from the US and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Uh, US tech firms today, for example, rely heavily on Chinese manufacturing technologies and Chinese made hardware. Uh, 
And what's even more problematic about this framework is that winning the AI arms race is often understood to mean achieving dominance in all areas of AI. And this is quite simply a tall order that completely ignores the fact that each country has its own comparative advantages. Right, so is trying to achieve dominance in all subdisciplines in AI critical to national interests? Is it even desirable? Well, Cold War mentality precludes us from even asking these questions. But fortunately, right, as, as students at USD, we have the space and the tools to take a step back and, and interrogate dominant frameworks like this. And when doing so, it becomes clear that this kind of thinking can increase the chances that policymakers in both countries may mishandle AI risks. Um, here in the US, for example, the fear of being overtaken by China is already being used to justify inadequate privacy re regulation. Uh, so we see big, big tech already making the argument that restrictions on data collection could hamper their ability to compete with China. Um, this mindset, could also clearly lead to missed opportunities for AI development, uh, especially as scientists and re researchers in both countries come under pressure to stop working with one another. Moreover, this approach to AI feeds into the already intense security dilemma that currently characterizes US-China relations. So the security dilemma, this is a core concept in international relations that describes how one country's efforts to make itself more secure end up causing another country to take measures that wind up making the first country less secure. So for example, the US might acquire AI enabled weapons, uh, which might cause China to invest in its own AI weapons capabilities, which in turn leaves the US less secure. Right, so this is functions like a spiral with each side becoming more anxious and less secure in the long run. Now the actions uh, taken by, by both the US and China also have the effect of fueling perceptions of the other as an adversary. And the more each views the other as an adversary, the more likely conflict becomes. And the more difficult it then becomes to cooperate even in areas where both have shared interests. And I'll return briefly uh, to these ideas at the end of my talk. Oops. So I don't mean to understate the security risks of AI. Um, and indeed, the, the so-called arms race over AI is understandable when one focuses on uh, its, its national security implications. So one set of concerns uh, emerges from the vulnerabilities that come with being so mutually dependent on each other, right? Whether it be respect with respect to uh, various AI technologies themselves or to the hardware and other components that these technologies rely on. Uh, so for example, for AI systems, semiconductors are absolutely essential and these are those very, very tiny silicon uh, chips shown here uh, that our computers and all of our smart devices need to process data. Now, China supplies many of the raw materials needed to make these. Um, the US specializes in design and Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan manufacture. But because there are so few players in the game, it's possible that China, right, for example, could be cut off uh, from critical supplies. And, and given that it's manufacturing, military and other capabilities depend on these products, that makes China incredibly vulnerable. Other risks that come with uh, mutual dependence um, include espionage and sabotage. Um, so both the US spy on each other, right? They've been doing this for decades. But the use of one another's internet infrastructure and operating systems make each exponentially more vulnerable to having sensitive data exploited. And the same is true with sabotage, right? So in a conflict over say Taiwan, which is the most volatile flashpoint uh, in East Asia today, um, both sides would be vulnerable to disruptions of critical infrastructure that could paralyze society. Um, moreover, as AI systems are 
further integrated into critical components of society, countries will become increasingly vulnerable to artificial intelligence attacks in which adversaries can weaponize uh, and manipulate AI systems in order to serve uh, malicious goals. Now, AI also has the potential to change the way that war is conducted, uh, although this arguably has, has been overhyped. Um, so will it actually cause a revolution uh, in, in military affairs? Well, although autonomous systems are becoming increasingly important, there's little chance that autonomous drone swarms, for example, uh, will altogether replace troops on the battlefield. Um, you know, in, in reality, it will be very hard to train a drone to operate autonomously in, in an actual war. Right? An actual battlefield is very different from a controlled laboratory environment. Um, so AI systems are, are brittle in this sense. You know, they're entirely dependent on the data on which they've been trained. Uh, and even the slightest, the slightest change in the environment could, could render them uh, useless. Uh, but one significant and understated way um, that AI could transform warfare is by compressing time. Um, and what this means for warfare is that to defend against machine directed weapons, militaries will increasingly rely on algorithms to detect and neutralize them, right? So as, as things happen faster, the time for informed consensual decision-making will become compressed. And this could increase the likelihood of misperception uh, and mistakes. Now, in addition to more you know, traditional security related concerns about AI, uh, there are also concerns about how when in the wrong hands, right, this, this technology could erode liberal institutions and liberal values. Uh, so in China, um, AI is used to bolster its surveillance state um, and it's, it's used to uh, monitor and control the population. And so Dr. Morgan showed us how AI is transforming surveillance and, and we do see this happening uh, in China. So if you visit Beijing, for example, you will see dozens of security cameras on every street corner. Uh, you will see them on buses, outside of convenience stores, on school gates, on, on traffic lights. They're, they're everywhere. Um, I remember before being able to you know, to, to visit colleagues and friends at Beida. Uh, so one of the, the primary universities in Beijing, and I would often just slip right through the gate because I blend in. But today this would be impossible uh, because of the use of facial recognition cameras. Um, so the government relies on this surveillance network, right, assisted by AI for internal order and security. And indeed violent crime rates are very low. Um, and because the Chinese population is so large, right, over 1.4 billion people, AI providers have access to enormous pools of data. And so surveillance algorithms are continuously improving, such that soon uh, experts expect that anyone who enters a public space could be instantaneously identified and matched to a sea of personal data, from text messages to travel records to past purchases. Right? So it's hard not to imagine the cost to civil liberties. And in China, um, those who pay the steepest price are those who pose a potential threat to the regime, the political dissidents and ethnic minorities. Um, and in Xinjiang, a province in Western China that is home to the Uyghur minority group, uh, China's surveillance state is especially robust. The government has invested billions of dollars into building a high-tech surveillance network there, uh, which is comprised of thousands of virtual fences or checkpoints, such that whenever someone is tagged as a potential threat, the system can trigger an alarm whenever that person leaves their neighborhood or enters into a public space. And to determine whether or not someone is a potential threat, the government requires um, ethnic minorities there to download nanny apps on their smartphones that can scan audio and video files and, and that can monitor their internet usage, right? So China's leaders have embraced the use of AI to predict and prevent terrorism and crime. 
right, to identify those who pose a potential threat to the regime. So this includes people who might not even have existing criminal records, right? They might only have downloaded a passage from the Quran onto their phone. So this, this idea of pre-criminals or pre-terrorists is what is used is, you know, by the government to justify the forced detention of millions of ethnic Uyghurs in concentration camps, where they are forced to renounce their religious beliefs and undergo re-education programs. So all of this, it, it sounds quite dystopian, um, but, but why should we right here in the United States care? Because uh, after all, we live in a democracy where civil liberties are protected. Um, well, China has emerged as a major player in the exportation of surveillance technologies. Um, you know, that the US of course also sells this technology to other countries. But the affordability of China's systems makes it particularly appealing in the developing world, particularly in other authoritarian countries or countries with weak democratic systems. All right, so given what's at stake in terms of national security and liberal values, right, how should the US approach the intensifying competition with China over AI? Well, the dominant approach, sorry, the current approach that the US and China for that matter uh, is taking is one of techno-nationalism, which in turn fuels the perception of an arms race. So techno-nationalism, it, it involves the use of policies that promote innovation at home and protect domestic firms from foreign competition with the aim of enhancing national power. And for the US, the embrace of this framework has involved responding to China's AI advances by pursuing a tech decoupling, right? So this has involved trying to disentangle supply chains and reduce dependence on China. Um, so the US has, has done this by implementing export controls on advanced inputs like semiconductors, uh, investment limits to prevent Chinese companies from acquiring American tech firms, um, and by banning the use of Chinese tech hardware and infrastructure. And it has also uh, involved efforts to invest uh, heavily in research and development at home, such as through uh, the recent CHIPS Act. Um, now, many see these measures as necessary. And again, if you think that every advance by your adversary comes at a cost to yourself, then you are bound to view winning the AI race as absolutely crucial. But the downside is that decoupling, by definition, undermines cross-border collaboration. Um, and AI advancement, especially in the United States, has depended on human ingenuity, raw materials, and labor sourced from around the world, including China. Um, you know, a AI advancement is a truly global endeavor, right? With, with respect to skilled labor, for example, a recent study found that half of AI professionals in the US were born abroad, many of them in China, right? Many brilliant Chinese researchers have, at least in the past, come to the US to study and ended up staying and working for American companies from Microsoft to Snapchat. Um, moreover, techno-nationalism involves adopting policies that, that risk harming global tech supply chains. So rather than driving AI advancement, Competing in this fashion could actually uh, set back AI development. And from an international relations standpoint, this kind of thinking could also lead to self-fulfilling prophecies by fueling the perceived need for an arms race. So in other words, the, the more leaders in the US, for example, treat China like a tech adversary, the more it will become one and vice versa. Right? And as competition continues to spiral, both sides will become more vulnerable to accidents, such as the premature deployment of accident-prone weapon systems or um, the unintentional proliferation of dangerous technological capabilities. Right? And all of this could undermine national and international security for everybody. Um, so, so once again, the policies that are taken today in, in the name of national security could paradoxically uh, end up making both sides less secure. 
so how can we ensure that we make ourselves uh, more rather than less safe? Well, the key is to figure out how to compete in a way that still allows for much needed collaboration and cooperation. Um, US-China dialogue and cooperation is crucial, right? If we are to reduce the global security risks of AI. Uh, and as the two most powerful countries in the world, both need to take the lead in coming up with ways to avoid unintended military escalation and the proliferation of AI-enabled weapons. Right? There needs to be a governance mechanism in place to ensure that AI-enabled weapons are in accordance with international laws and norms. Uh, and these countries also need to reach consensus on what targets and what types of data should be considered off limits. And the sooner we can reach agreement on these questions, the better, because once these technologies become adopted and integrated into military plans and doctrine, the more difficult it will be to restrain their uses. But unfortunately, Techno-nationalism makes dialogue on AI governance politically very difficult um, you know, at, at the present time. Um, so that, that brings me to an end, but in my desperation to end on a positive note, um, I do think that the urgent need for international cooperation, especially against the backdrop of major technological change, right? This, it, it makes this an incredibly interesting time to be a global citizen and to be part of this conversation, um, which I do think your time at USD will, will prepare you for. And thank you so much. Indeed, thanks to the panel. It was, uh, this is, as I told you, I promised you a fantastic panel and they truly were.